I'm Daryl Kirch. I have the pleasure with, with Tom Naska of co-chairing the collaborative with Victor Zhao as our chair. I, uh, my day job is as president and CEO of the Association of American Medical Colleges, and my discipline is psychiatry. So given how uh, much this issue of burnout seems to have overlaps with PTSD, depression, suicide, substance abuse, similar issues, uh, I feel a personal and professional interest in this. Uh, what we're going to do now is, is basically crowdsourcing, get your input about what you've heard this morning, about what your own experience leads you to believe about how we framed our work and, and how you see it, uh, where, we're, where, we're, where we've got it right, where we might not have it right yet. Uh, and I want to ensure that since we have people on the web, that those of you who uh, use the chat function, I guess it is, on poll, uh, and poll everywhere slash well-being, uh, you can enter in a comment or question. Part again, so everybody gets it's that. a poll ev so p o l l e v dot c o m slash well being. Okay, so we'll ask. We'll give the first chance, assuming somebody can uh, write a question in to somebody who's working remotely. And while we're waiting for that, and while we're waiting for some of you to come to the microphones here with your input, I'll just make one quick observation. I was struck by how many times this morning people referred to. Uh, really the, the role the Academy played in partnership with so many of us in the area of quality and patient safety. Uh, and how I think this effort is, is analogous in so many ways. One way that, that occurred to me as I was listening to all this this morning is what got us in trouble about quality and safety was uh, a presumption a presumption of quality. We felt that we were the best trained, hardest working people in the world using the best technology. Therefore, we presumed we had high, the highest levels of safety and quality possible. Uh, that was proven to be wrong, and to err as human uh, was the wake-up call. Uh, we've also had another presumption that we can handle it. Whatever the work environment throws at us, uh, whatever personal stresses it creates in our work-life balance, we can handle it. And I think this initiative is uh, attempting to help us all understand how wrong we are uh, about that presumption. Uh, I've, I've told my colleagues in the steering committee, I consider this analog to be to care is human. And human beings have limits. Uh, and many, many of our colleagues encounter those limits and are suffering because of it. So, Alex, if maybe you can lead off by uh, a question from one of the participants. Sure. So, that, and then we'll go to, uh, Chris. great. One of the comments uh, related to the external factors work group and workflow working group was: Can we change the focus on teams to a focus on healthcare community? So, uh, can you hear me now? Is that better? Can we change the focus uh, for the external factors work group on teams to a focus on the healthcare community? And I have my colleagues from the working groups here uh, in the front row. Um, my initial assumption hearing that question is the healthcare community is broader than just the frontline care team, and it extends uh, to those who are engaged in the community's social determinants of health and to the patient and their family as part of a single community. But uh, Lois or Art, I think that was part of the reason you redrew your diagram. Is that fair? We have a mic here that if you can pass it to the working group co-leads. <clears throat> the answer is yes. And one of the things that we talked about and uh, that diagram is still dynamic is in the first of those slides I showed you, we kind of had arrows that circled and that didn't get put into the second one at the moment, but I think may need to be because it begins to show how all those external and individual factors come into play and 
a number of those things I think this uh, questioner may be wondering about if you look at all those little small areas of writing in those eight different areas, probably a lot of that comes into play. Uh, I, th I think this working draft will be posted online and you'll, at some point you'll be able to see it and, and work with it. Uh, I know if you were beyond the first three rows, you couldn't read the fine, fine font below those larger domains. Oh, please, Pam. I would just respond on behalf of the external work group to say that um, it, it is not our initial intent to limit team to what is probably being perceived as an organizational setting only. So the group will, will discuss this to talk about, you know, how we can make sure that as we're talking about high-performing teams, uh, we're talking about uh, a any setting where, again, that, that might apply. And that might, I think that might respond to the uh, question. And I might ask, I, I, I realize I should have done this at the beginning, because the knowledge resides in the, the leads for the working groups. Why don't we come, come on back up? and sit in the chairs up here and pick up one of the mics. Just the leads, co-leads for the workers. Daryl, another question which was raised is, is this a just a domestic problem or is this an international problem? So perhaps somebody. I know this was uh, part of the focus of the original work in the first steering committee meeting in the research group, but the extent of the problem internationally. Steve, Bob, you, do you want to comment? Is this on? I think we need all these mics on the. Um, I, I can maybe comment on that. Can you hear me OK? Um, so we have not purposely not looked at that, I, though the, the literature that I'm aware of um, shows that is not a phenomenon unique to the United States, um, but it's felt all over. Um, most of the, when we were looking at the data that's been published, it's virtually all in the English language literature, however, um, but it's not unique to us. So I, I can comment on that. I, uh, as part of our uh, federation board, we're involved with an organization called IAMRA, which is the International Association of Medical Regulatory Authorities. Uh, we had meetings in Australia earlier this year, a huge part of that meeting related to burnout. I was asked to come speak in Brazil because of the level of suicide among physicians in that country. So it's, uh, it's everywhere. Uh, then some folks in the office will come back to web question or folks in the uh, building here. And if you'd say who you are, uh, that would be great. I'm Christine Castle. I'm the planning dean for the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine, uh, due to take our first class in 2019 and very focused on this issue of wellness and resilience for medical students. Um, and I'd like to particularly uh, focus on um, the comments by Orly Avitzer from Consumer Reports and urge you, us, to include patients and consumers at every part of this collaborative and not just as one component of it. Um, and I, I draw on a lesson from the time when I was at the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation and we began the Choosing Wisely campaign that was to address this issue of overuse in healthcare, a, a one that was very, very active, a lot of fear and concern about rationing and death panels. Um, we partnered with the American Medical Association and the Board of Medicine Foundation to develop a plan that was very effective. That's what made that campaign so powerful and helped the um, consumers, the non-healthcare people, to understand the issues and take ownership of it themselves. So <laughs> I think that um, I'm not surprised to hear what you said, that people don't understand, consumers don't understand, they have their own problems, they have um, and they don't need this microphone up there. I think 
consumers would welcome the kinds of conversations about patient safety, about medical errors, about improving physician-patient, provider-patient communication, uh, and all the discussions that surround issues that will not only improve patient satisfaction, but clinician satisfaction. a major theme we talked about in the steering committee yesterday is how we can broaden. We have a, this growing network of professional societies, health systems, and hospitals, how we can broaden that to also include very actively patients and patient groups. We talk about shared decision making. I think we also need to talk about our shared distress. Uh, please. Jeff Berger, I'm uh, Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education at GW, two blocks up the street. Um, I'm also an anesthesiologist, deal with um, substance abuse and other issues uh, quite, quite actively. Um, I have a business degree. I got it um, down at uh, Fuqua and Duke, and at my business training, we learned that uh, the goal of business was to maximize profits. Um, they were only regulated in their effort to pursue maximizing profits by the regulations that were provided upon them. And, it was a little distressing as a, a medical doctor in that environment trying to learn um, what I needed to understand the business language that I would be needing. And I think one of the things I've noted in my short practice career is that we've given up ownership of our specialty, of our careers, of our profession to big business. Um, the lawyers, as some of you might know, are prohibited from having any ownership of their law firms from any non-lawyers. But we in medicine are not, and we've sold out uh, over the last couple decades huge portions of our ownership stake to people that don't have a stake in the ethical obligations we have to patients and their care. So I wanted to ask, as we as doctors in the last couple decades have switched from being the, the revenue generators, the people on the asset side of the balance sheet, to people who are liabilities on the cost center side and we're being squeezed. Where, who at the table and where in our sponsorship and where are the people sitting around here who are representing the businesses, the private equity groups, and the large publicly traded companies that now own us? That, Rob? I, I, think, no, I, I think you've hit on a core problem that affects a lot of physicians that you know, the, we went into medicine not to be business people, but as medicines become more and more corporate, the physicians, and I'm sure it's the same for the other healthcare providers as well, are just cogs in the, the machine. And so that loss of purpose, that loss of professionalism, I think is at the, the core of much of the, the burnout. Um, you know, it does hurt your resilience when you feel that your job is just to uh, generate more uh, RVUs. And I think the other um, effect of that is that we've focused more on income than we should. Uh, I mean, I routinely ask my faculty, um, you know, if, if you had more autonomy, if you had more control over the things that you do, uh, would you be willing to sacrifice uh, the, the income? So far, most of them say yes, but there are a few who say, uh, no, I kind of really like the money. Um, so I, I think we, we have to be honest with ourselves that we, we've given up a lot um, in the pursuit of revenue. Interestingly, medical students who complete the uh uh, AMC matriculation and graduation questionnaire now routinely say that they're willing to sacrifice future income prospects for better work-life balance. You know, the, the question uh, is, I think, Bob, you were touching on this. It isn't just when you have a for-profit hospital or you have a, a private capital group buying physician groups and the like. 
it's the business culture we've allowed even within our own not-for-profit system. And that's been a major topic of discussion. It was one of the things that uh, I think brought some of our sponsors to the table. They understand the, the tension that's there. So we're really pleased to have the American Hospital Association and, and like groups with us. Uh, I think Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm John Henry Fifferling. I've been doing this since 1972. Uh, my dissertation research, I'm an anthropologist, was a study of physician resistance to change based on the distress I discovered when they were learning to deal with the problem oriented medical record, and that's got to the computerized record. So I've been around a long time. I started a nonprofit in 79 after doing three residencies as an anthropologist, although now illegal by HIPAA, to understand how the natives felt and then decided to do something about it. So I'm incredibly pleased to hear the, the quality of the people that have been here this morning, and I'm worried, I wasn't real worried about my legacy, and now it looks like we've got it in good hands. I want to share a few things with you in uh, my uh, antique years of doing this. I'm still doing about 10% and 50% now working with law enforcement professionals on a comparable situation. That's also a culture of silence and denial uh, with tremendous devastation impact on uh, citizens. Um, Number one, the culture is incredibly successful in producing its outcome. That's called burnout. Also called grief as a result of reality shock. So we're dealing with an epidemic of grief syndromes with inadequate training on how to deal with grief. We don't give our trainees in whatever profession, medicine, veterinary medicine, pharmacy, nursing, or, um, or um, I'm missing something anyway. Um, Pharma, uh, uh, training in human factor non-chemical coping skills. I taught a non-chemical coping course at the pharmacy school in Chapel Hill and where I live, uh, and a new dean came in and said, we can't teach that stuff to our pharmacy students, even though the pharmacy board could not deal with anything other than drug and alcohol problems with their pharmacists. Uh, number two, uh, we need to study the factors associated with people that don't burn out that don't end up with depression, that don't end up with migraines, et cetera, et cetera. Just like in neurology, we study headache problems, but not who doesn't get headache. We also have to look at those kinds of factors. What does that mean for vetting people in? What does it mean for teaching those kinds of things? Number three, I have a friend, Chantelle Brazeau, University Medical School in New Jersey. She is the Dean of Physician Vitality. As far as I know, there's only one Dean of Physician Vitality looking at academic faculty burnout, which is a tremendous epidemic beside Dean burnout, a whole other phenomenon. Um, we need to reinforce collegial synergy. What can you do in the interpersonal environment as you're working with anybody around so you give people appropriate, positive, timely feedback? We do beautifully at criticism, beautifully at sarcasm, beautifully at one-upmanship, beautifully at disabling perfectionism, but minimal positive appreciation and praise that's honest. Um, Number, uh, finally, almost, I wrote an article six years ago, which I never got around to publishing, on preventing suicide among psychiatrists. There is not one article in the literature on the prevalence of suicide among psychiatrists and what to do about it. Tremendous denial in that subset, beside all the problems we have, and especially that you saw this morning. Um, finally, I ask my clients, I've done about 5,000 interventions on individual physicians and uh, mostly physicians in the last 40 years. Um, would you, on your tombstone, have liked to have written, I wish I would have worked more? And they almost invariably answer, I don't wish I would have worked more. So uh, a few things you need to be aware of, and I'll share more with Charlie and the group as uh, I hook up with them. Thanks for being there. Thank Thanks for the population. And I'm really pleased with what you're going to do to move forward. And, and for those of you who have more substantive comments that, that don't lend themselves easily to this setting, you can email them uh, to us. Uh, I think Charlie's email was, yeah, it was on the initial slide that Victor showed. So let's go to, if you don't mind, to the web. Alex? Yeah, so there was a question about the challenge of physicians and other clinicians seeking help and how it might impact uh, the views of their impairment as it relates to state medical boards? Just a simple problem. <laughs> so the uh, 
Federation of State Medical Boards has been very actively involved over the past year looking at this. We have been uh, looking at all the different state applications that are out there, what the questioning looks like, what impact potentially it can have, how some states don't meet the uh, law of the American Disabilities uh, Act in terms of how they question. So we're in the process of developing guidelines to recommend to state boards how they need to think about this, how they may need to redraft the questioning of this. And where we are at the moment is that we feel that we need to focus on impairment, not on diagnoses, and we need to focus on impairment at a current period of time, not asking questions 10 years ago, did you have some mental health issue? that probably got corrected and now is not an issue anymore, but unfortunately sometimes get to ask. And we recognize that this has huge stigma and it prevents physicians from going and getting care so that they don't have to acknowledge that they have the problem. So hopefully by next April, we'll be able to present this at our annual meeting to the House of Delegates to get approval. It will be then a framework that state boards can use it won't be something that'll be adopted by everybody, but a third of the states right now ask no questions at all. So there's various pockets here that each state fits into, and we need to move the uh, uh, level towards uh, doing this in a way that doesn't discourage people from getting help. And Pam, is there uh, a similar problem or initiative in nursing, or do any of the attendees know of other health profession licensed licensing bodies, actions in this regard? Uh, yeah, similarly, we, we have variability in all of our state boards of nursing as well. And uh, you know, th the primary push is to make sure that for individuals who uh, you know, declare they have an issue, that they're seeking help, that there are alternatives to discipline and that everything that, is, that can possibly be done to allow that practitioner to get the help they need to continue to practice to not have this stigma or to not have dramatic action taken against someone's license is really di the direction that we're going. Thank you. So on this side. I'm Alan Garl. I'm a uh, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a uh, practicing primary care general internist uh, with a long career of mentoring students going into uh, internal medicine and especially primary care. Um, <clears throat> I have one concern about everything this morning, uh, which has been very, very thoughtful, but suffers, um, I think, from uh, being so comprehensive and so all-inclusive that we have the risk of uh, not prioritizing. And I'd like to borrow from uh, Ken Ludmer's uh, conclusions in his uh, history of academic medicine uh, time to heal. He actually thought about, I think, um, saying no time to heal uh, as the title of the book. But basically what he came down to is that we have lost our focus um, and that <clears throat> what we're seeing is the symptom of the loss of ability to heal. Um, and the, the loss of that ability comes from the loss of time. So I would like to hope that as we focus on where we're going, we really look at it from the perspective of providing time to heal. Because again, all of us went into this field, anybody in healthcare has gone into this as a healing profession. And we're all, you know, when, when people come to speak to us, clergymen, they all say, you know, God please bless us. It's very touching. And they, they want, to bless us because we are the healers. And we've lost that ability and I think a lot of the burnout is a function of that. Now to drill down on two areas that I think might be relevant, one is <clears throat> uh, the need for fundamental payment reform. And the second is fundamental need uh, for documentation reform. Even if we move away from fee for service, which does rob time, uh, and we go to value-based care, we have now entered an era of documenting every process known to man, and we have very few outcomes. And uh, if Big Pappy um, of the Boston Red Sox had to document every time he spit into his gloves, 
Um, and every time he uh, swung the bat or uh, did something else, and it was irrelevant what his batting average was, I think that um, he would now have the situation that we live in, and he might be uh, discouraged as well. So I hope that we'll prioritize. I hope that we will function on time and other impediments to healing, and that we'll look at payment reform, and we will also look at, um, at outcomes in place of process uh, as the way in which we meet our obligation to document and uh, be accountable. One last thing. Um, the term provider was originally uh, given by insurance companies to physician organizations, not to physicians or other healthcare professionals. And I think this term provider should be dropped from our lexicon, and I hope we will substitute professional. Yes, we have other members of the teams who are also quote unquote providers legally under Medicare, but they are, they are professionals, they are not providers. And I hope that in this report, uh, we will drop the term provider, as by the way, some of the pharmaceutical companies are doing in their ads. It's now call your healthcare professional. So that's just a, uh, a request, thank you. Thank you for the input. I do want to stress, in our early discussions, one of the challenges was uh, a lot of people had a single cause, root cause, and the, the uh, leading favorite in all this was the electronic health record. And if we just fixed that, the world would fall into place. We uh, early on acknowledged it was much more complex. That led to the conceptual model but the conceptual model is not, not intended to say all these various factors are equal. But Lois, did you want to add to that? I, I think one of the most important things we are hearing back is it is important that the complicated complexity can be visualized at one point to avoid people taking one thing and missing what is in their system. But a system for prioritizing, not only among the descriptors, but also then as we drill down in the model into the, the therapy and the preventive aspects and things like that. You mentioned the importance of words, and I know within our discussions, some of the, the concept has been, so how do we reframe things? And to use the electronic health record as an example, something that was sold as good for patient care but was actually built to help with billing, how do we reframe it so that it actually goes back to benefit primarily patient care, which should save time and really assist us in doing our job. Thank you so much for your comments. And to the right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dwayne Taylor, and I'm an otolaryngologist uh, locally, and I'm um, here re representing uh, the task for first task force from the American Academy of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. I also sit on a task force for the Montgomery County, who's working with uh, physician well-being. And um, I wanted to make two comments. One is we can't lose sight of the fact that we can intellectualize and we can put together all the data and what we view as being possible solutions for this uh, urgent problem. Um, but we have to make a culture shift in how physicians are able to not only recognize but accept the resources that are out there. And um, it also brought to mind when the comment came up about making sure we involve all levels of the, the um, community in terms of consumers and, and that sort of thing in the process of trying to look at this, but realize there's an educational curve that has to be achieved with that group as well. And having interacted with individuals who um, are not physicians but want to be a part of a solution there's a steep learning curve. You know, we're put on these pedestals, of, and there's not a real understanding that, you know, as was mentioned, we're human as well. So we can't lose sight of trying to make sure we have uh, efforts in trying to change this culture shift from the, the ability of, to help the ability uh, for, of physicians to be able to understand that they have to, um, they have to be an active part of creating that environment to accept the assistance that's out there. 
Thanks. Uh, we've talked about this a great deal, Cult and culture is very much a local phenomenon. There are national uh, and professional elements, but a lot of the, the active change in this will involve leadership at the local level. Please, and then we'll check with the web. Hi, I'm Julie Eminger. I'm a doctoral student at the College of Design, Construction, and Planning at the University of Florida. Um, so I'm your design thinker. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Um, I was part of a, a phenomenal grant writing team specifically looking at the role um, of the physical environment in emergency departments. We knew going in that there had to be in place or attached to um, new design organizational and culture shifts. So I'm hoping that that comes with this initiative. Um, but I wondered if in your, your conceptual models, you figured in the contribution of the physical environment. I think the built environment is, is a great factor. When I was listening to Dr. Moss and he talked about things that were immutable, uh, I found myself thinking uh, there are a lot of dissatisfying elements in the critical care units that I, you have to wonder could design changes make it a, uh, a better environment for the caregivers. But we have an emergency doc in our conceptual model team. Any comments, Steve? Or I would just say we have talked about the environment, but I don't think we've used the word design, and bravo for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Yeah, I think we, yeah, your, Lois's point and yours, we really didn't think about it from the physical, but we've thought about it of realizing that we had to consider academic versus private practice versus early career, mid-career, student, so we need to think about some of this other stuff that you're bringing up to us as we are conceptualizing this, so thanks. Yeah, I would add that the work that that the external factors group is going to do, particularly as we look at team effectiveness and the whole environment. That is the built environment, too. Um, there is a lot that nursing can contribute to this discussion. Uh, not only has the Critical Care Nurses Association done extensive work over the last decade to, uh, to issue and refine its healthy work environment standards, but also organizations have acknowledged that as we're rebuilding or having to retrofit in environments, we need respite space. We need areas for staff to have uh, places for relaxation. So if they're emotionally fatigued or physically fatigued, that they're able to address that. The culture shift that was addressed as, as well is this needs to be universal for the healthcare team. It is not unique to one discipline. <coughs> I would just point out that even the discussion about the loss of lounges for professionals to go to and have community is, is one example where this is being talked about. Thank you. So we're all entering that zone of brevity. We have five minutes left, so please. Uh, my name is Sid Hartshaw. I'm the C CEO of Greenleaf Integrative. Uh, I'm a physician, public health scientist, and change agent, and my, those are my lenses by which I'm asking this question. The question is about burnout as a construct and as a banner that is, we're, we're, uh, first of all, disclaimer, I love the subject and I want to support burnout prevention. But from a critical-minded standpoint, I'm, I'm often uneasy about loading uh, a construct to mean too many things. And to some extent, it's, we're trying for it to mean the opposite of physician well-being. And so my question is, um, what are the implications of us using burnout as, as the banner? From your perspective, what are the implications, unintended consequences, uh, what are the positives, uh, what's the strength of it, just any kind of critical thinking around burnout being the describer? I, I think the, the, uh... Thank you for your comment. That's very important and feedback to us because I don't think we are using burnout or we intend to use burnout. I think there's been discussion about it being um, factors for clinician well-being and resilience much more from a positive lens. 
but how important to know that that's what we think we're doing and yet to observers that may not be coming through. So thank you. I think the language we use and some other people have talked about this is crucially important. at the fact that there aren't bright line compartments of burnout, depression, symptoms of anxiety, suicidality, and so on. There's, there is uh, a lot of vagueness there. We just are talking about all the insults to well-being for clinicians. And what we're, we're trying to achieve is improved clinician well-being and resilience and by looking at all of these different factors. So we've got three folks left. <laughs> Somebody on the web, and a few minutes. I'm getting the two minute sign, so we're all going to be crisp. Hi, my name is Cha Cha Chang. I'm with the CDC, uh, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. We've recognized healthcare as a high risk industry, and it's been a priority research area for us for decades. Uh, so we definitely are happy to see this. Uh, I wanted to, before we run out of time, let you know that we've been working with RAND to develop a model for worker well being. So we're happy to see some of the concepts that uh, we've touched on, which is a systems approach, looking at organizational interventions as opposed to individual interventions, and some of the uh, industrial and organizational psychology principles, such as autonomy, work scheduling, control. Uh, we also have worked with an international expert panel to develop an instrument, and we will be validating the instrument. We'll certainly share the instrument with you because we would love for it to be used. It is for all workers, but we certainly would uh, be glad to hear input on how it could be applied to clinicians and maybe a smaller model for that Great. too. And you have a CDC colleague who's on the steering yes. committee who yes. can be yes. a liaison yes. with you. Could we do one question from the web and then these last two? So the question was about, uh, for students, uh, high-stake exams, for example, USMLE. Um, is there some work by the research group that is looking at that particular issue? How does that impact burnout high-stake exams? We talked about the educational environment, and uh, many people in the room probably know that for medical students, step one of the USMLE has become this, uh, this huge anxiety-provoking hurdle for them because of the competitiveness of residencies. I know there's active discussion at the NBME about what can be done about that. At the AMC, we've actually been focused on working with both program directors and students to de-escalate the high stakes that are associated with it through a broad-based program you can see on our website, amc.org, Transition to Residency. It's a broad topic, uh, but that's a crisp answer. Last two questions or comments. where we're working on an initiative that has been really started by our chancellor. Um, and it emphasizes, I think, how important leadership is in going forward, not only at large healthcare enterprises, but also within <laughs> university systems. And I just wonder what um, the experience has been trying to gather other universities in a system-wide approach to help to solve structural problems and interventional problems within their own university systems? I would be the first to say I know that, that university academic health centers and then systems like Texas and California that have multiple centers have engaged in this. I, I, I don't know uh, what, if any, work at the larger university level has gone on but that might be something worth our exploring. Is your effort focused on the health professions or the entire university? I would focus on the health institution. Okay. And you have an upcoming yeah, meeting. We have a symposium uh, September 25th and 26th where we're dedicated to looking at the health professions and how That's in Houston, and I think we'd agree from the communication side, this is just going to help amplify the discussion. You get the last word. Yes. Thank you. I'm a resident, or I was. Um, that's until I saw severe, terrible, unethical practices at my hospital. In fact, it's here in DC. 
I've reported internally and faced backlash. I reported externally, including organizations such as OSHA, HHS, ACGME, and found no protection. And because of that, feared for my safety and lost my residency position. So what I want to ask the panel is it's not about doing extra work as a resident and all of that. Of course it is, and sleep deprivation is imminent and there's fatigue. But I think what is so distressing and really hurts our resilience is finding these barriers in reporting what we see and facing terrible, terrible retaliation and not finding any recourse or solution to the problem. And I think it's fair to say that on that conceptual model, when we think of items that probably should blow up into larger font, one of the key ones is leadership, not just at the highest organizational level, but down to departmental programs uh, and so on. But well, what protections are there? Because within a hospital, their bottom line is to protect themselves. So at all costs, at any costs, they will weed out the weak link, which in my case happened to be me. I mean, there was a program director who was acting as a program director who shouldn't have been the program director. There was grade changing, botched surgeries, <laughs> terrible medical negligence. With all due respect to the situation you encountered, as you can imagine, in a situation like this, it's difficult uh, for us to speak to a single case. And I'd be glad to speak with you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. What I would like to emphasize for the group is none of what you've heard this morning is a finished product. We really want to get more and more input from you. Uh, we're going to be setting up, I hope, better and better mechanisms, the Knowledge Hub in particular, to facilitate that bi-directional communication. And uh, this is a campaign, as, as Victor said earlier, and I think these, we, we are in the earliest stages of this. This is going to be a long haul for all of us. But uh, I've heard so many of you speak today with passion about this topic, and that's what makes me think we're going to have great success. So please, once again, thank our team leaders here. for our wind-up panel.